I'm really, this is a very special person to me who's going to be speaking next. Uh, Adam was, for a crime he did not commit, was my, uh, how, I was going to say brother, brother, mother, but actually is my executive officer. And actually his wife, Kate, was also my executive officer. And, uh, you know, there's a million war stories I could tell you about uh, Adam and I's adventures uh, during the period that, that we were serving in, in the Pentagon. But I will tell you one story about Kate because Kate, we both acknowledge is like way smarter than either one of us. And I don't know how many times Adam, Adam and I would be talking about a problem sitting, looking at each other, and Adam go, I know, we need to ask Kate. <laughs> I can tell you uh, that, was, uh, that was very true. Uh, Adam is, uh, please take a look at his bio. He transitioned very interestingly from act, an active duty officer, and you can take a look at his bio. He worked in Air Operations Center. He's, he's worked in embassies. He's done, been a military judge. He was a staff judge advocate. He did everything as a JAG. But he also is now teaching at NDU, and he's teaching really strategy. It just goes to show you that when you get this course, a skill set, it can be applicable in many different, many different domains. I'm not going to take any, up any more, any more time. I want to get to Adam, but let's give him a very warm welcome. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Kate's husband. <laughs> All right, I am going to start with a quick story. I only tell it every few years because the audience changes, but really fast, right? So I'm in the CAOC, the, Com the Coalition Air Operations Center, right? I'm the senior lawyer there. I have to come home on emergency leave. We have two small kids at home at the time, toddlers, right? By the way, they turn into teenagers, and that's hell. Different <laughs> issue. OK, so um, I'm there for about 10 days. It's time for me to go home. I go downstairs, I have my backpack, all my gear, and my three-year-old daughter is at the foot of the stairs crying her eyes out. I bend over, I'm like, Sarah, Daddy loves you. I've, I, I've, I've got to go. I've got to go back. And she's crying and crying and crying. And I said, but you know what? I'm going to be back um, in two months. I get this mid-tour. I'll be home for two weeks, and we're going to go to Disney World the whole time. It's going to be wonderful. And she's still crying and crying and inconsolable. And I say, look. Sarah, the, the taxi's outside. Daddy's in the Air Force. I've, I've got to go back. And she slowly starts to collect herself and looks up to me and says, Daddy, Mommy took the iPad. <laughs> <laughs> so I tell that story at National War College for a reason, right? Um, one, to embarrass my daughter. But the other one is because so much of what we do as strategists and policymakers, is based on assumptions, right? We have this saying that assumptions are the sea upon which the ship of state sails, right? A lot of the time, we treat stuff as fact when, in fact, it is an assumption. And because it is an assumption treated as a fact, we don't go back and revisit its accuracy. And so we make all sorts of mistakes. It's a long list, right? We'll be welcomed in Iraq with flowers. We will. It goes uh, 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 thousands of them, right? What I want to talk today, though, is about an assumption that people are making about the role of international criminal justice and the problems that we're now starting to confront with it. There's a dark reality that we have to face about the future of international criminal justice, but there's also a way to move forward on it. Okay, And everything I'm saying, that's the National War College, by the way. I'd like to call it the only example of existing American imperialist architecture. It's beautiful. <laughs> okay, so. What is international criminal justice? Narrowly, right, the field of law dedicated to investigating and prosecuting those who perpetrate unjust wars or commit law of war violations during conflict. And in the DOD, we use the term law of war, international humanitarian law, and law of armed conflict to mean the exact same thing. OK, so we just get to charge people three ways by phrasing it three different ways, right? A couple things to think about. It's only about 80 years old. Right as a formal field. In fact, before 1990, if you were in this field and practicing in it, you were more likely to be a PhD than a lawyer. We're going to talk about that in a minute. It's a pillar of the liberal international order. Now, there's a term that we throw around all the time, the LIO, the liberal international order. And I'm going to get into that a little bit here in my presentation. And here's my point. It's dead on life support, 
We're all, well, almost dead, right? And we're going to talk about a way that we can save it. But in order to save it, I submit, and this is my thesis, that we have to have a paradigm shift about the role of international criminal justice going forward. And that role, I hate to say it, is not in international courtrooms. It's in a different arena entirely, and we need to prepare for it. All right, so I'm going to go through some history here real fast. We have a large range of uh, people with different levels of experience. This will be familiar for some, um, an introduction for others. But a couple things. We're going to talk about where it comes from, the idea of accountability, and the fact that it was very, very limited until after World War II, the legacy of Nuremberg, and then where we go from there. Okay, so let's talk about this a little bit. Who here has studied just war theory or the just war tradition? Handful of folks, okay? Um, some of us were around when it was created, okay? Um, <laughs> all right, so just war theory, right? This is the idea. This is at least in the West where we get the idea that there is certain conduct that governs when you make the decision to go to war um, morally and justifiably, and then once wars start, how is it that wars have to be conducted in order to do it in a moral way? And the reason it starts is because the early Christian church was a pacifist entity, right? They preached pacifism. The idea was turn the other cheek. But the problem is human nature takes over, right? And the church is left, the early writers are left with this horrible dilemma. Do we get killed? Or as they're looking at it, do we let an innocent person get killed? Or are there times when deadly force can be used? And so this development starts to come out that, yes, there are times where you may need to use violence, may in fact have to kill somebody, but have not excluded yourself from the kingdom of heaven. And that was necessary for the church to survive. Now, it goes through a number of iterations from, um, from Aquinas and others. But for our purposes, where it really comes to affect us today is when Hugo Grotius starts writing about international law in the aftermath of the two treaties that make up the Treaty of Westphalia. Okay, and this is going to be really important here because this gets into the question about when you can legitimately go to war. And remember what the Treaty of Westphalia does is it sets up the international system that we have today. Basically, a third of the continent of Europe had killed itself during this war over religion because one country would invade another country either to convert apostates as they saw it or in order to rescue their own co-religionists. And the decision is made that the only way we're going to stop these wars is to have an ironclad agreement that says what happens on my territory is up to me, right? It's the principle of non-intervention. Yes, horrible stuff is going to happen, right, in those countries, but it is better off to let that happen than have constant invasions going back and forth, all right? And so starting in 1648 until our own time, right up to the UN Charter, the basic parameters of the Westphalian order, that is the concept of non-intervention, governs international law and international practice. Another thing that emerges, which is important for us to remember, is that these two concepts, right, use ad bellum, when is the resort to force justified? That is, when can you go to war? And this idea of use in bellow, what the conduct in war is, those are separate, right? And they're separate for a bunch of reasons, right? We don't want to hold Private Smith responsible for the fact that the, the, their leader went into the war, right? Because if the war has started illegally and Private Smith thinks that she's going to be prosecuted because of the decision of the leader to go to war, Private Smith has a heck of an incentive not to stop fighting, not to stop shooting, to keep the war going, right? Plus to build a greater peace in those aspects as well. But when you look at this, it's really important early on when talking about international criminal justice to bifurcate those two pieces. All right? There's always people that are trying to pierce this and blend them, but this is the tradition um, that we get to. All right. Let's talk about the foundations, really, for the second part. Right, The first part, this idea of non-intervention. Remember, under international law to this day, there are only three reasons that a country can go to war with another country legally. Right, One is in self-defense. Two, that the UN Security Council has authorized it. Or three, the country that a country invites another country in to help, right? So the reason that the Russians are flying Russian flags in Syria is because Assad invited them in. The reason that they were fighting with little green men in 2014 in the Ukraine is because they had no legitimate basis to be there at all. Those are the three main reasons. Okay. Now we'll get into R2P, responsibility to protect, in a minute. But let's let's leave it there. Now the foundations. This is going to build a little bit on what General Deptula just talked about. The foundations for 
how to fight and how to conduct wars really emerges out of the Enlightenment, their earlier parts, right? This idea that every human being has value. During the 17, 1700s and early 1800s, laws of war develop, but they're not really codified, but they're rooted in this idea of protecting civilians. And then we get to the American Civil War, right? And so Lincoln has a problem in early or late 1862, early 1863, because the Confederacy has said that any African-American soldier, 179,000 African-Americans will fight in the Union Army. The Confederacy says, you know what, they are servile insurrectionists. If we catch them, we're going to execute them, and we're going to shoot the white officers that are leading them. So international law, or the law of war at the time, doesn't allow that. But Lincoln produces this thing called uh, what Lincoln's Code. We call it the laws of war, which outline what the various rules are. It's originally necessitated in order to protect African-American soldiers. That's why we get Andersonville prison, because nobody's exchanging anybody, et cetera, et cetera. But it also articulates about when somebody is a soldier and when they're not. When are they protected? But the key is this is an incredibly permissive law, right? The idea is, yes, you can apply fires if there is a reason to do so to help win the war with certain protections attached to it. So to give you an example, this is where we see for the first time that you, in order to have the protections, in other words, be treated as a POW and sent home when the war's over, right? You have to carry your arms openly, you have to wear a uniform, and you have to be in a chain of command. Now, that, why are those three things there? Because the main threat to the Union Army in 1863 were guerrillas and bushwhackers that weren't carrying their arms openly, that were destroying boats on the Mississippi, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea here is to make it as permissive as possible, right, but still have some protections for civilians and the wounded, et cetera, et cetera. And within a year, it's made its way into the first Geneva Convention, and it goes from there. Okay, so when we're talking about the laws of war, remember, they are designed to be particularly permissive. The thing is, though, that not a lot happens with these new laws of war, right? The idea of when you can go to war, that's not really shaped until after World War I very much with the League of Nations when it's finally getting codified. But even prosecuting war crimes itself, it really doesn't happen. And the reason why is what? Because of that sovereignty principle in the Westphalian order that has been created. After World War I, there is an attempt to prosecute German war crimes but because of the sovereignty rules that are governing states, it has to be done by the Germans themselves. What do you think the track record is of countries prosecuting their own veterans for committing war crimes? It's not very robust. Okay? And so the Germans do try to prosecute some people, and that trial is actually used to plant the seeds of the big lie for the first time, the stab in the back theory, and nothing comes of it. Right? There are attempts to prosecute some of the Armenian genocide cases and whatever. Nothing really happens despite the horrors of the First World War. Now, that doesn't mean that some countries aren't on their own prosecuting uh, violations of the laws of war, but usually it's because they have violated an order, an internal order at some point or another. All right. And then we get to the horrors of World War II. And for the first time, we have a tribunal that is set up with an agreement of the great powers to hold the Nazis responsible, even though their decision to make war was made on their own territory, and even though a lot of their soldiers that, in the SS that commit these crimes are actually answerable to the German army or the German Republic. But the decision is made that this is so horrible, and we have got to prevent another event like World War II, that we're going to set up this tribunal. Now, this is key. This tribunal is ad hoc, right? It's made for the purposes of handling this event, World War II. It is not permanent. When it's done, it goes away, and it has limited jurisdiction, right? The people that are holding the trial don't hold the other folks responsible, okay? So in other words, don't hold themselves responsible. And so we end up with a situation that we're really looking at Stalin's lieutenants judging Hitler's. But this was part of the deal to get the Soviets to participate. They wanted this trial for a whole bunch of reasons. It's a legitimate trial. Justice is applied. But let's remember that the legitimacy of this at the time is somewhat questionable. Now, I'm going to break off this history for a second and talk about the evolution that happened since then. Okay? Very importantly, anybody ever read about Mr. Lemkin? 
Yeah, in the beginning of Samantha Power's book, A Problem from Hell, indispensable reading if you're going to work on, on genocide issues. The idea of the Genocide Convention is this. For the first time since the establishment of the Westphalian order, there is going to be a law that allows countries to pierce the sovereignty of another country to hold their leaders responsible if they commit genocide, even in their own territory. That had never happened before, right? And so we get the Genocide Convention. It's ratified. The Soviets ratify it. By the way, for the Soviets to do this, to ratify it, they had to pull out as one of the crimes killing people for political reasons. If you kill them for race reasons, if you kill them for eth ethnic reasons, et cetera, et cetera. The theory behind this is what? Crime against humanity. What's a crime against humanity? It doesn't mean that the humans, the people getting killed are the victims. It means all of humanity is the victim because if you wipe out an entire people, you are robbing humanity writ large of something incredible, right? And that's the excuse that they use, the explanation they use, the justification that they use in order to be able to pierce the borders of other countries to hold them responsible. And a lot of countries don't like this. Indeed, we don't ratify the Geneva or the Genocide Convention until 1988, right? The only reason we really ratify it is because Reagan goes to Bitburg, he needs to, a political win, he goes to the National Security Council and says, help me out. National Security Council says, here's something you can do. Turns out that the guy who says, here's something you can do is Oliver North. That's another story, okay, right? Doesn't come up a lot, but that's, you know, so at the same time that he's, you know, distracted with other stuff. Um, so, all right. But then nothing happens, right? Nothing happens until 1990. Now, I want to take a sidestep over here and get into the definition of what the liberal international order is, where this comes from. This is IR, international relations theory. Right? I see some of the cadets are nodding, some are familiar with it. Um, we use this term all the time without defining it. The best place to look here is a wonderful book called uh, Liberal Leviathan. Right? If you want to understand the history of the liberal international order, um, Professor Eikenberry, he wrote this book a few years ago. Um, maybe not as prescient as we would have thought. He was far more optimistic, maybe disregarded human nature a little bit, but that's okay. Um, all right, so here's what we're talking about, the three kinds of international order. Leave the word liberal out of it for now, okay? Unipolar, one country. Bipolar, meaning two countries competing with each other, and multipolar. But the key thing with any of these orders are, think of these poles as magnetic, right? The idea is that in the West, through smart power or whatever, these countries are so attractive to the populations of other countries that they are drawn to your pole. They align with you, they trade with you, they do defense agreements with you, right? Or in the case of the Soviet Union, your magnetism is at the point of a bayonet, right? You're going to align with us too. And then you have a multipolar world, which was traditionally, which is really what was set up by Westphalia and will exist until you get to 1945 and the bipolar world between the US and the Soviet Union, okay? Now, keep that in mind. When we have the bipolar period, which roughly runs from 1945-46 until 1990, international criminal justice is dead, right? It's not totally dead, but nobody's getting put on trial. There are no international tribunals. There's one, the Israelis get Eichmann, fly him out of Argentina, and they put him on trial, and then the Israelis are promptly condemned for invading Argentina to grab Eichmann, right? 1976, July of 76, the Entebbe raid, the UN Security Council spends the next week debating what? Not the act of terrorism, not Uganda's support for the act of terrorism, but the Israeli invasion of Uganda that day, right? Because this idea of international sovereignty, uber alles, still trumps the dialogue in the international world, right? And it's because there's a bipolar world. Neither country wants to open that door and let other people hold them accountable because it's not what? In their interest to do it. Unless there be any doubt, Cambodia. Why was nobody put on trial in Cambodia? They are eventually, there's some trials of some very old men in later years, but decades go by and the Khmer Rouge gets away with it. Why? Because in April of 1979, when the Vietnamese go into Cambodia and end the largest genocide since World War II, the Carter administration says we can't have a Vietnamese puppet government replace the Khmer Rouge because that'll give the Soviet 
Chinese Communist bloc another vote in the Security or in the uh, General Assembly that will then rotate onto the Security Council someday. So Carter orders the UN mission to keep the Khmer Rouge in the seat at the UN, even though he knows what they have done. Why? Because it is in our interest to keep another communist from having a seat in the UN. Think about it, right? I'm not judging. I mean, this is this is right. The, the, this is this is the, the nature the nature of a multipolar or bipolar world. Countries will be driven by what's in their interests. And then in 1989, the Berlin Wall comes down. Um, when that wall's coming down, I'm applying to Columbia to the School of International Public Affairs in order to study the Eastern Europeans and the Warsaw Pact. <laughs> so I went to law school. Um, and then we get the unipolar moment. We know when the unipolar moment is because General Deptula is sitting in Saudi Arabia a massive army is being moved into Saudi Arabia in order to fight a land war against a Soviet client state, and the Soviets are doing nothing because they can't, because it's not in their interest to object to it anymore. And we get the unipolar moment. Charles Krauthammer coins the phrase in January during Desert Shield, right before Desert Storm. Okay? Now, what does this mean? A unipolar moment, we then have to look at what the unipolar moment stands for. Our poll, what do we stand for? We stand for the liberal international order. That is our poll, right? And it works. It attracts a lot of countries in because the populations like it. So what are some of the main things? Well, there they are. But for us, human equality, freedom, rule of law, and human rights. And now we can start championing international criminal justice. And we enter the golden age of international criminal justice between 1990 and 2011. Every single person indicted by the ICTY either dies or is brought to justice and then dies, or will eventually. Right? I mean, think of this. Rwanda, well, the, the, or Sierra Leone, we have a large, and the reason why is because the Chinese and the Russians are sufficiently prostrate that they don't oppose it. They think it's in their interest to support it, and they vote in favor of it. We get the International Criminal Court. Not a fan. Not the point, right? The ICTY here stands up and think about this. We now have, for the first time, that court that was envisioned by Woodrow Wilson and others in order to hold and pierce sovereignty and hold other people accountable and leaders accountable for committing war crimes, right? The idea is really twofold. Hold people accountable, but also drive other countries to hold their own people accountable, lest they get brought into the International Criminal Court. Who hates this? Who hates the unipolar moment in the liberal international order and why? Okay? During the 1990s, our strategy was one of enlargement, one of expansion, right? The idea was we're going to bring countries into the international order, into our order, into our camp. It'll spread democracy, and we believe, rightly so, that democracies don't go to war with other democracies. They go to war with everybody else, but they don't go to war with other democracies. Okay, but, and that's in our interest, right? It's called democratic peace theory, which got mentioned yesterday. But a few things happen, right? Democracies spread. Liberal democracy spreads significantly. But for Putin and for the Chinese, there's a conflict. We want human equality, freedom, rule of law. Non-intervention, they're relying on that. And ultimately, they want non-intervention in their country, right? Which is the essence of what they think they signed up for. But we want to spread liberal democracy. And Putin doesn't want liberal democracy. And Xi doesn't want liberal democracy because their regimes are totalitarian and authoritarian. And so there are certain things that start warning us that the liberal international order is not going to triumph around the world. One is the disaster in China, right? Tiananmen Square. At this point, this is where the spread of freedom really meets its end because China, the Politburo, rather than risk being put in the dock themselves, decide to crack down and end any spread of democracy in China. It's going to get worse. If you want a declaration of war on the West, probably too strong, but if anybody had any doubt, in the 2007 Munich conference, this is where the tide turns openly and we start moving towards a multipolar world because Putin stands up there and says, America, you are ignoring non-intervention pledges. 
right? You're ignoring international law. You have overthrown governments in Iraq. You've overthrown governments in Afghanistan. My friend Ceausescu is butcher on and on and on. And so he's, a, and he says that we are not following international law, let alone a liberal order. We're only doing it when it's what's in our interest. And then when democracies start creeping up to his border, like in Ukraine, he sees it as an existential threat. Why? Because if there's a vote in Russia, he's going to lose. Same thing in China. They are so worried about losing power that the spread of liberal international order, right, democratic principles undermine their ability to stay in power. Interests, interests, interests of those that are in power drive it. You get the Arab Spring, right? The Arab Spring further scares the hell out of these folks. Why? Because of these smartphones, folks are able to go around the gatekeepers of information and stage a revolution. And this causes a panic, too. If you want to know why the Chinese curate the internet, it's because of this, right? And we're still trying to figure out what these do. I mentioned the joy the other night. The last time we had a change this big, the Catholic Church split. We had a 30 years war and ended up with the current international order, right? So we're still trying to figure this out. And their response is we're just going to shut it down. And here's the last turning point. In 2011, UN Resolution 1973, the Russians and the Chinese are like, okay, if you want to go into Libya in order to prevent a genocide in Benghazi, we won't vote against it. We won't veto it. And what happens in October, six months later, more regime change. Okay, so from the perspective of the Russians and the Chinese, this whole idea of responsibility to protect, which does require a UN Security Council resolution in order to send troops in, right? They are never going to do it again, because to them, this was just a subterfuge in order to change the regime one more time. And they point to all the other examples. We can't get an R2P resolution right now to condemn ISIS, right? We go into the UN Security Council, and Russia is able to veto. So it, it, is, it has changed and proven that we are now in this multipolar world. The ICC, OK, I can't help myself. All right, so the ICC. Right? Part of the problem with the ICC is it's deemed illegitimate. Right? Whatever the reason, they are constantly going after African countries. And you can imagine for the continent, I've worked with a lot of African officers. And what does it look like to them to see African officers being pulled back or threatened to be pulled back to The Hague and prosecuted by a former European colonial power? Right? They've become hyper-politicized, singling out the Israelis, on and on. We can talk about it. They ignore basic principles of complementarity. Let's go back to why Nuremberg worked and why this doesn't. It's not ad hoc. There is a statute, the Rome statute, that makes this thing permanent. So it's always going to be there. It's not going to go away, which means eventually it could be used against the Russians or the Chinese or us. And as time goes on, like any court, right, their jurisdiction expands and expands and expands until there's an authority to limit it, and that authority doesn't exist. All of this means that the prospect of ever putting Putin in the dock, or Putin's lieutenants in the dock, or holding Xi accountable for genocide of the Uyghurs, or holding the, uh, insert the list here, are nil. Because it is, un unless there's massive regime change in those countries, unless somehow the liberal international order spreads to these totalitarian states. There was some conversation yesterday about, OK, well, if we capture Colonel Schmedlap, Right, because he committed a massacre um, in, in Bukha or something, and we're going to put him on trial in the International Criminal Court or whatnot, I guarantee you the Russians will do the same thing that they did during the Cold War. Fine. We're going to prosecute Lieutenant Jones for his war crime. Lieutenant Jones didn't commit a war crime. You want to risk it? Right? That's how we were. That's basically this agreement that we had that kept us from putting the other people on trial during this period. Now, all is not lost. Right? What I am suggesting here is we need a paradigm shift, a new way of thinking about the role of international criminal justice, which is still important, still worth studying, but we have to move the arena, especially, for example, what's going on in Ukraine. Let me ask you this question. If Putin's army wasn't committing atrocity after atrocity after atrocity in Ukraine, would Ukraine still be getting all the weapons and support that the Ukrainians are getting? Let me ask you a question. If ISIS wasn't decapitating people on television and burning people in cages, is it possible they still might have a rump caliphate? What is going to be able, hopefully, to deter these countries, 
or deter countries from committing these war crimes is to appeal to their interests, not because of some weak threat to someday hold them in the dock, but to expose the horrors of what they're actually doing, such that it garners inter international support for our cause. And we need to learn how to do this. Sometimes we dismiss it too quickly. We need to move from the courtroom to the information arena. And what that means, law school curriculum, right? I submit that anybody teaching international criminal justice and international law should also marry it up with courses in public diplomacy, communications, and marketing. By the way, to give me these slides, right? Those are the happiest students following war crimes I have ever seen in my life. I teach a course up at the National War College called War Crimes and Strategy, and we have to do these flyers for it. And the first, my first year there, I say, War Crimes and Strategy is a practitioner's course. All right, and so this, the dean comes up to me and says, Adam, I don't think that says what you want it to. I'm like, ah, well, oh, damn it. So, right, so I have to make 50 more flyers, whatever. OK. Um, what does this mean, all right? Public diplomacy. This is a real field. There is empirical studies about what works and what doesn't. There are resourcing decisions. There are messaging decisions, right? Public diplomat, your public diplomat, if you are an international lawyer versed in international criminal law, you partnering with the public diplomacy effort can get the attack on the enemy's legitimacy for either what they're doing or the decision to begin the war in the first place in the public sphere so that it's spread by the ungatekeeped, is that a word? <laughs> Information environment, right? Integrating with non-governmental organizations and other actors, it's great. All of you under 42 should join the JAG Corps. But if you don't, if you can bring your legal skills to non-governmental organizations, Right? and explain to them, like General Deptool was talking about this morning, what the laws of war really say and what they don't say in order to advance our interests and show, no, these are what the rules of war really are. That can be more meaningful if you reach a million people right, than, I don't know, writing your PhD on it, which I didn't do because the Cold War ended. Anyway, um, <laughs> right? OK, so public diplomacy aspects of it. Studying other countries is really important. There is one country that has been through this. The social media war, the first social media war, was the summer of 2014, Operation Protective Edge, when the Israelis went to war against Gaza, against Hamas, because they were shelling them, right, because of the rockets. And Mike Schmidt wrote a wonderful article. He went through and he goes through it all, and he says every single target that the Israelis hit, except for this thing on 2 August, we won't get into that, right, was perfectly legal. But the imagery, in Mike Schmidt's comments, the imagery of those deaths that follow from it, the children that are dying and the people that are dying, are tweeted out not by Hamas, but by the citizens of Gaza who are able to get this message out. And when people are looking at images of dead children, they don't care if it's legal or not. All they see are the Israelis killing people, right, without the broader message. We don't know. A lot of people don't follow this. They don't know what's going on. All they see are dead children, and that has to be wrong. And the Israelis were very, very slow to figure out how to do this and what it do, how to respond. And the impact is it severely restricts the Israelis' ability to apply fires on necessary targets. Like General Deptola said, right, there are legal restrictions on what can be done or not done, but it's really important to remember it's often very, very permissive. It is not a legal decision about whether to apply fires. It is a policy and operational decision that has to be owned by the commander. And we've created a generation of commanders, as one of my friends says all the time, that's used to having the lawyers underwrite their decision. Is it legal, Jag? Yes, do it. No, not anymore. Is it legal, Jag? Thanks. OK, now what's the public affairs impact of me doing this strike going to be? And is it worth hitting the target, given the information utility that it's going to give? For countries like Hamas, is never going to defeat the IDF. But if it can get enough images of dead children out in front of the Europeans and the Americans, such that the boycott, divest, and sanction movement starts to work using, we could call it lawfare, right? They're going to have the ability to drive the Israelis coercively through another angle. And there are examples of this. So the lessons here and where this ties in is this. Great book on this, Warren 140 Characters by Patrick Karakos. Fantastic read. A um, little bit dated now. It's from 2014. But he's the first one to really write about the changing character of war. Right? So what do we do? Remember, war has an enduring nature. It's always going to be violent. It's always going to be interactive. And it's always going to be political. But its character is always changing. Who fights? 
how, fight, how they fight and why they fight is always changing, and it's usually the side that can figure out and adapt to the changing character that will have the upper hand. And here, he's the, he figures out that these have changed everything, right? And changed the character of war, at least in small conflicts. So a couple things that the Israelis figured out. One, merge your lawyers, merge your legal experts who know what the law is into your information cells and your intelligence cells because speed ability to get this information out but also to time its release is essential. So what the Israelis figure out halfway through the war, for example, a hospital's hit, they figure out, wait a second, that hospital was really hit by an errant rocket that lands on the hospital that's fired from Hamas, right? But they hold it. They hold it until 8.30 on a Sunday morning. Why? because they can send their ambassador onto all the Sunday morning talk shows and drop this figurative literal bombshell, right? But to do that, it took the legal folks in it involved, the information, and here's the other piece, and this is a real foot table stomper, right? The other thing the Israelis figured out, we talk about who fights, right? That other character of war piece, the diversity of thought is essential. The Israelis figured out that it was the 19-year-old corporal and the 21-year-old social media based reservist lieutenant who understood how to do this, understood the keys to messaging, understood who the attack, who the audience is, understood that if you phrase things a certain way, we can get it into the news net and add to its legitimacy, right? So this is really important also. And so what should the international criminal justice's new target be, right? If the doc is no longer really an option, at least not for a long time, the enemy's legitimacy. The legal piece is important to the extent that we can delegitimize what the enemy is doing, their basis for going to war, how their conduct is being done in the war, and ultimately in order to limit their support and enhance ours. It's a paradigm shift that a lot of us aren't going to be comfortable making because it requires a different way of teaching, a different area of study, stuff that's new to us, but if international criminal justice is to survive in a meaningful way so it doesn't go back into the purview of the PhDs, not that there's anything wrong with PhDs, but you know what I'm saying, right? So it's not an academic only th This is a change that I think we need to make. Subject to your question, sir. Go ahead. Adam, that was absolutely fabulous. That, that was <laughs> Two quick things. One, Adam has a blog post on Lawfire where he outlines some of this. Uh, we're filming this, so it's eventually going to be online. Uh, but let's open it up. We have time for a couple questions. Sir. Hi, I'm Peter Robinson. I'm a criminal defense lawyer at the ICC and other international tribunals. <laughs> I just always, have, always look at the guest list first, and I didn't. So. I just have a softball question for you, actually, and that is, do you believe that we should have trials at absentia? No. Unless they serve a public affairs purpose. <laughs> look, trials in absentia, we have, any time that we do this, we have to think, OK, why are we doing this? Why is it in our interest? What are we hoping to achieve? What is the political aim of doing it? And so if a trial in absentia is only going to further delegitimize in the eyes of an awful lot of people the legitimacy of the liberal international order, then it's not worth it. Look, when the Cold War ends, when that wall comes down, everybody came to us. We could have gone in the other direction, right? The Europeans could have gone to East Europe, and they didn't. Why did they come over to our side? Not because of our nuclear weapons, but because of our freedom, our culture, our all of these things, right? Our legitimacy. I won't be worried about this country too much until we start having refugees from places trying to get into China and Russia, right? But we have to protect that. And to the extent that a trial in absentia um, further feeds in, I'm just worried about the ICC's legitimacy because, and, and we want to make sure that justice is considered fair and, tri and trials in absentia are, are harmful, I think, in the long run. But that's a, a big strategic picture. Um, I'm also not sure of the deterrent value in that. So, yeah, that's a great question. Well, Adam is going to be around uh, afterwards during the break. Uh, 
give you one last shot for a question, Harris. I'm looking right at you. What's your? Because I, I can see the wheels turning in your head. I know you have a question. So. They're still turning. I'm sorry. I don't. <laughs> uh, it's one over there, sir. I'm Andrew Coiner. I'm a, one of the London scholars from Vanderbilt. Awesome. So you talked briefly about ad hoc tribunals and how that's going to be that's almost impossible at this point to set up just because you've got the Security Council and Russia and China aren't, aren't are going to veto those. Do you think there's a do you think there's ever a future where you can use more localized uh, localized uh, groups like, for example, the African Union, to set up specific ad hoc tribunals through those, through those bodies instead of through the Security Council? So there's a whole British theory on this, right? I mean, the, British, the Brits have come up, small powers have come up with these ideas, right? Is it possible to do it? Yes. Okay. But if, are you going to have an AU country put a leader of Tigray or something on trial? You might, right? And, and you might be able to do that. But to the extent that the Chinese and the Russians and other leaders look at it and say, you're undermining the Westphalian order, which is what we signed up for, okay? And I, I, I would put it this way. There are multiple orders right now. Ours, the liberal international order. Unipolar moment's over. There's the Chinese model, very economically based, authoritarian. There is the Russia weak state gas station with nuclear weapons model, okay? Um, to quote John McCain, all right? But these are competing, to, these are, these are competing orders. Right? And that would be great. Right? I, justice for victims is huge. I was a, a prosecutor, defense counsel, and, and judge for years. For the individuals, it's extremely important. Right? But from a national security American interest point, to the extent that we can do that legitimately and support it, that's great. But I'm telling you that there, there were reasons why trials didn't happen between 45 and 91. And part of it was because it led to a tit for tat um, and ultimately undermine justice even even more potentially, but it, it, it context is everything, right? So so it depends. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, Adam, again, Thank fabulous. Thank you so much. <laughs> Enjoy the the next nine minutes, uh, and then we'll come back and we'll have our, our next presentation. And before that, we do that. I, I am going to bring in some of our volunteers so that we can thank them before